Hello, I am Miguel Favre, a communications officer within the Department of Infrastructure, Ports and Transport. And as the name suggests, the Department of Infrastructure, Ports and Transport has numerous departments under its purview. And one of them is the Electrical Services Department. With me today is the head of that department, Mr. Shane Jha, Chief Electrical Engineer. Welcome, Shane. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. To start of our discussion, can you speak to the mandates of the Electrical Services Department? Okay. Well, first of all, let me, start, let me begin by saying that it is my opinion that um, given, the, given the, num in the number of ways that the Electrical Department touches the life of, of, of the ordinary citizen, that this department forms one of the most, Im this department is one of the most important um, you know, divisions within the Ministry of Infrastructure. And that is saying a lot, considering that infrastructure is a priority for almost every government. But uh, um, someone once said, and I'm sure you know who, that um, the influence of the Ministry of Infrastructure begins from the time that you, s you, you step out of your home, right, and you hit that road. I will go one further and see that the influence of, that, of the, the, the electrical department, and by extension, the, the Department of Infrastructure, begins from the time you flip that switch in the morning. But to come back to your question, the electrical department, we're responsible for several things. Primarily, we, we, do ins we, inspect, we inspect, test, and certify new, new and, um, you know, new and, and, new and um, existing. existing installations. Secondly, right, we also um, maintain the, the, the traffic light, all the traffic lights on island. We also um, administer the, the, street lighting asset in, or in, the street lighting asset in St. Lucia. Additionally, we, 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 we also recommend qualifications for, um, for, the, for, for granting new licenses to, to, to to electricians, right? That's that's these are the main these are the main things that we do. But additionally, we're also responsible for things that are we don't carry we don't we don't carry out that often. For example, um, you know, we're also responsible for um, administering the the real electrification program. And at times, right, we are also called upon by the fire department, right, to aid them in, in the investigation of, of fires when it is suspected that electricity is involved. Now let's get to the traffic lights first. Let's start off with there. Interestingly, just a few weeks ago, we relocated uh, traffic lights at the intersection of Jeremy Street and Darling Road. We came under some scrutiny for that. Uh, there were numerous public complaints. Could you explain to us the reason for that relocation? You see, I was a bit taken aback by all the criticism, right? Because Give, especially given the nature of the improvements. Let me begin by saying that we never relocated any lights. All we did was to, 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 to turn one of the lights, the signal that you see that is closest to the, to the Bexon bus stop. Mm -hmm. So you find that it existed a situation where that light was not visible, right, to motorists when they were approaching that intersection. So therefore we had to change the direction of that signal. So as it stands right now, from any direction you're approaching that intersection, right? You, you, you will, you, uh, there will be a signal right ahead of you, right? That you'll be able to, you know, follow. You understand? So, um, so although, although we, we, there, was, there were certain things that we were supposed to do. I mean, I, I, it's only afterwards that I realized that, you know, the public was not too familiar with, the, with some other devices, some of the auxiliary devices we had placed in that intersection. For example, the pedestrian, cross but the pedestrian push buttons that activate the, the, the pedestrian lights. These, were a bit, these things were a bit um, new to them. So I understand the nature of, of, of some of the criticism. But generally, I would say that the intersection is a lot better than it used to be. We installed, for example, um, we, changed, we changed most of the lights. Well, we changed the signals there from 8 inch to 12 inch, so therefore that they are visible from very far. We added visors to the signal so, so that they are visible even in the sun's glare, you see? So therefore I would say, in my opinion, that the sig the, the, that intersection, right, is a lot better than it used to be. Okay. You mentioned visibility on a side note. Um, is your department, in terms of the installation of traffic lights in the future, would be catering for the hearing impaired? 
Absolutely. As a matter of fact, this was supposed to have, this was supposed to have been done with the installation of the lights at, at um, Bridge Street, Bridge, at, at the intersection of Bridge Jeremy, and also at um, the, that intersection by um, Bridge John Compton Highway, or what, what we usually, what we are more familiar as, what is more familiar, what is more, more commonly known as um, Bridge Penya Street, I'm right? Sorry, I should have said that, I should have said the, the Visually impaired, not hearing impaired. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I understood the question. Yeah, but in the future, we will be catering to, 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 to these people. Okay. Yeah. Now, while the enforcement of traffic laws and rules don't fall under your department, you just install and program the traffic lights, uh, there are certain traffic infractions and violations which affect negatively the way these lights operate. And I speak specifically to the road sensors. Uh, this has been an issue and members of the public don't seem to understand that these infractions do actually affect the way the lights operate. Can you speak to how these sensors are affected? Okay. You see, when we talk about a traffic light system, right, it is interpreted by many people as just, you know, the part that is seen, which is usually what we call the, the, the signals, the traffic light signals. But uh, a traffic light system usually, cons well not usually, it, it consists of, of many things. There's a cabinet close by, which is where the brain of the system is. Obviously, there are the signals that are visible to everybody. There are the, the pedestrian lights, that especially the ones, um, it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is known it is known to everybody now because we, we have installed the pedestrian lights all over the city. Mm -hmm. First of all, we installed by um, the intersection by Jeremy, Jeremy um, Peña Street, and now also by um, by Darling Road, Darling Road, Jeremy Street. Um, however, there is also this important component, which, is this, which are the sensors. Now, the sensors are not visible. The sensors are situated just below the stop line as you approach, right, that intersection. Now, I'm going to explain to you what exactly these sensors do. I'm going to give you a situation. Let us take, for instance, that you are, you are approaching an intersection, right, and the lane ahead of you is clear, mm -hmm. right? On the, on the normal circumstances, right, you would have to wait for the timer to reach zero, and then that, the light that is controlling your lane of traffic would turn green, and then you would be allowed to proceed. However, when there are sensors present, right, the, tem the timer does not have to reach zero. So basically, that sensor, right, senses that the lane in front of you that you're about to turn into, right, is clear. So therefore, the, the light that is controlling your lane of traffic, it automatically turns green. So therefore, there is no wait time as, as long as the lane in front of you is clear. Now, this significantly reduces on the, the amount of time you have, to, you, have to, you have to stay idle, right, at a, a particular intersection. However, when buses are packed on these signals, right, on these, um, on these sensors, it is interpreted by the system that they don't exist. So even if these sensors are there, because there is a, a stationary object packed on them, right, you still have to wait for that timer. So it delays the, 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 the whole, you know, the whole cycle is delayed. Because I said, as I said, it is interpreted by the system as if, you know, there's no sensor. So you still have to wait. Rather, so basically it becomes a situation, it becomes a situation whereby, right, the lane in front of you is clear. The sensor should have been communicating, right, to the light that this lane in front of you is clear, so therefore I should turn green. Mm -hmm. However, because the system now isn't aware that the sensor is there, right, you have to continue waiting. Okay. So there are a lot more delays at these intersections. Okay, so you're saying that, as you just mentioned, the bus park there, the concern recently expressed about the lights, the same lights at the Jeremy Street, Darling Road intersection, uh, was that at one point they were taking long to turn, the signals were taking long to turn from red to green or green to red. You mentioned buses parking there. So are you saying that double parking or parking in restricted areas would affect the sensors? Absolutely. You see, these sensors, right, they're affected by, you, basically you must give them a six, a six, uh, a, a free fit clearance either way. So basically they pick up, they pick up um, stationary objects, right? that are above them, mm -hmm. free fit, within free fit, right? In front of them and within free fit at the back of them. So basically, wh whenever you within that vicinity, this, that six feet vicinity, right, is going to appear. If, a, if an object is, is, is 
is unpacked, if a vehicle is packed on that sensor, right, or within a, 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 a six, that six feet ring, six feet root CNT I'm talking about, is going to be interpreted by the system, right, as, you know, a sensor which doesn't exist or a sensor which isn't working. So basically, it becomes a situation where, where, as I mentioned earlier, right, you have to wait for the timer, even if the lane in front of you is it's clear. clear. So does this, does one sensor affect the way all traffic lights operate, or is it just for that particular area? I'm talking about in terms of parking over those sensors or being stationary over the sensors. Yeah, pa parking over, the, over, over a sensor at a particular intersection will, will, affect, <laughs> will affect the entire intersection. Okay. So basically, not just that sensor that you were parked over or that lane, right, mm -hmm. carrying that sensor, but the entire junction, the entire intersection. Because remember, as I mentioned earlier, right, the brain of that system is in a cabinet that is close by, and everything, all communication happens, right, via that, that brain, through that cabinet. So I would take it the message to the motoring public is to not park on double yellow lines and only park in sports reserve Absolutely. for parking. Absolutely. Okay. Now, back to the push buttons which you mentioned earlier. Uh, we have an issue with the Department of Infrastructure for, as it relates to the destruction of public infrastructure. And that would include bridges, signs, uh, the convex mirrors placed for people to see at intersections. But then recently, again, with our newly installed lights, or replaced lights, we had a button destroyed the day after we installed it. Uh, can you speak to the destruction of this, infrastru this infrastructure, and is it something new? I don't know if you recall growing up with um, payphones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whenever you had to use these payphones, <laughs> there was always an issue. It's either the receiver was missing or the glass, the little glass was, was cracked. But it was always a situation where a lot of the time, right, these, for no apparent reason, somebody would destroy these, these little phone booths. And I was really hoping that, that we, as, we as a people, we had graduated from that already. But it, it appears that we haven't. And that is a very serious issue and it's a costly thing for the department. Um, an ordinary, a, a very basic, traffic light system can cost anything between 200 and 300,000 EC dollars. Wow. And um, we don't produce this per se. So therefore, the destruction of, um, and I mentioned two, two to 300,000 dollars. That's only, I'm only talking about the, the, the per se. I've not even fi factored in programming. Because every time you, you put in a new, a new piece, so you, you have to replace a piece, right? You have to reprogram the system, right? So therefore, it, it profoundly affects the, 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 um, the department, not, in, not only in, in terms of um, the cost involved in replacing these, these parts that are, that are destroyed, but also um, delays. Because you find that we have to buy these parts in the US. Now, usually in the US, you find that these parts, right, the parts that are kept in stock, right? Do they don't have the same specifications as the, as the parts we require here. Mm -hmm. A simple example will be most of the parts, right, that are kept in stock in the US, right, they're 120 volts, 110 volts. However, in St. Lucia, we use 240 volts. So therefore, you find it's a situation where, where when, you, when we order these parts, right, they have to be produced specifically for our condition mm -hmm. or with specifications, you know, that are, that are that are, you know, 240 volts and so on and so on. So basically it means that the delays are even longer. So basically it affects, it really affects us, not just economically, right, but also with the delays involved. So you find that the destruction of a, of a, a path, right, might be, it might be a situation where a particular intersection is down for a lengthy period of time. Okay. You're watching Issues and Answers. DIPT in focus. I am Miguel Favre, communications officer with the Department of Infrastructure, Ports and Transport once again. And with me is Chief Electrical Engineer, Mr. Shane Zhe. We will take a break and when we come back, we speak to more of the Electrical Services Department's mandates, particularly electrical inspections. Pamela, I noticed that you built your retaining wall on my property. You will have to give me my land back or compensate me for that. My contractor isn't dumb. I trust that he will not build anything on your property. Where is your proof? Let's go to court. This situation does not require you to go to court. Looks like we have to go through mediation here. Mediation is a way people resolve conflicts like this. Someone, a third party, comes to speak to both parties. 
This person is called the mediator. The mediator is impartial. He or she makes sure that communication between both parties is effective and efficient. So, the mediator is a judge? No, the mediator is not a judge. Mediators, unlike judges, do not decide cases or impose settlements. Let me get a mediator to handle this retaining wall and that kitchen. Kitchen? Yes, your kitchen also falls on my land. Let me call the mediator. Welcome back to Issues and Answers. Uh, Miguel Fabry once again with me, Mr. Shane Zha, the Chief Electrical Engineer in the Department of Infrastructure, Ports and Transport. Uh, Shane, uh, let's get to another mandate, which is the Electrical Inspectorate. And it touches the lives of basically every solution from personal homeowners uh, to business entities. Can you describe the process, the, election, the electrical inspection process and the process by which, you know, it is the OK is given for a connection? OK. Yeah, you're very correct in saying that, huh? because um, <coughs> the general public usually <laughs> knows the electrical department to be the electrical inspectorate. As a matter of fact, there, there are very few people that know that we actually men do maintenance of traffic light. And we have some, some scenes with street lights and so on. Anyway, to get to your question, you see there is a, a, a common, um, there's, a, there's, a pers there's a false perception that um, interaction with the electrical department only commences, right? After the construction of an electrical installation, and that client is looking for an electrical connection. However, this is, this is not the case. When somebody thinks about constructing you know, an electrical installation, by electrical installation, I'm talking about a wiring for a house or a temporary wiring or whatever it is, right? Communication interaction with the electrical department should begin even before construction begins. So ba basically, the first, the, the first process, the first, um, the first thing should be Right? That, some, that client should hire a licensed electrician. Then that licensed electrician should bring into the Ministry of Infrastructure or to the electrical department what is called a Form B. Right? If right, that, that client is about to construct a new installation, if they're about to do an alteration to an existing installation, then they should, they should bring in what they call a Form C. Right? That Form B, Form C, or the, Right? That would indicate to us that that person is about to commence an electrical installation. So therefore, we'll be on, on, on the alert. And that is especially important right? when it comes to constructing installations that are very, very large. And that's going to take a long, a long time because we want to be going up and down there to see how, you know, how the installation is progressing. Because let's say, for instance, let's, let's take a situation where a huge installation has been, has been constructed and they only apply to us at the end. Then we don't know what's inside the wall. We don't know what's inside the flooring. We don't know what's in the ceiling, right? So therefore, it is important that the first interaction with the electrical department happens before construction and not at the end. Anyway, to continue the process. So after that, right? So basically, as I mentioned, they will bring that from B or C to the department, right? Hire an electrician, a licensed electrician, bring that from B, C to the, or B, B or C to the department, after that, they can proceed with the construction of the installation, right? Upon completion, that is when they apply to us again, formally, right? And obviously, the fees are paid. Then, within a week or so, sometimes a few days, we go to that installation, we carry out, we test, we, we inspect, right? They bring, back, they bring the information collected on site back to the office, where it is, you know, the papers are written up, the certificate is written up, and if everything goes well, if there are no issues with the installation and so on, right, a, a day or two later, that certificate is collected and brought to Lucilec, where the, 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 the connection is made. Okay. Is this inspection a one-off thing? Is it periodic? You see, the question you should ask yourself is very simple. Why, why, why are we even doing this? Because the thing about it is that, we are not just going to um, installations and inspecting. We are doing that for a reason. And the reason, that, re re that reason is, is, is safety, right? Now, as, in, as, is, as is the case with anything, right? Use brings wear and tear. So as you, as you use a, an electrical installation, there will be wear and tear. And the safety of that installation will degrade over time, right? So 
it is important that um, we inspect or, or we re-inspect and, re and recertify after a period of time. For domestic installations, right? And by, ins by domestic, I mean installations where the ordinary house, mm -hmm. right? That is done every five years, right? For commercial installations, commercial and industrial installations, right, where you seem to find a bit more wear and tear because of the number of people, no number of people using it, and so on and so forth, right? That's done every two years. And for swimming pools, given the nature of water, and, you know, electricity, and so on, that is done on a yearly basis. Now, obviously, some business entities, hotels, even homeowners may at some point want to expand on their property, add a new wing, a new room, or something. Uh, does the electrical department play a role? Obviously, they would have to get wiring and everything. Does the electrical department get involved? Well, we are supposed to, because as I mentioned earlier, right, the, your, your first step should be, you know, I mentioned the Form C earlier, and that's the whole point of it. You see, the Form C basically is to alert the department that you're going to be altering your, the existing installation. You see, when you alter an installation, an electrical installation, right, it is not going to be the same as what existed before. So basically, let's say, for instance, I've tested an installation. If you're going to alter it, if I test and certify a particular electrical installation, if you alter it, it's not the same installation, which means that you have to bring me back there again so that I can check and see and check to verify that it is still fit for purpose fit for use. Okay. I noted you said we are supposed to. <laughs> supposed, supposed to. <laughs> because yeah. you find that, as is the case, right, most of the time, well, well 90, 95% of, of, the, of the time, after an individual gets a connection, that is it. Okay. They so don't return to us after five years, or the business places usually, they don't return to us after two years. So you see, the important thing there is, you know, there's a lot of risk involved. Exactly. There's a lot there. of risk there involved. Because as I mentioned earlier on, right, if you find that uh, an installation, if we test and we see that an installation is safe right now, that doesn't mean that in two years or in three years or in five years, it is still going to be safe because that installation is under use all the time. Mm -hmm. You see? The wires, the wires, are the installation is degrading, right? The oof is not going to be the same anymore, you see? The devices break down after a while. So that installation is under stress. So you don't expect it to be the same as it was when you know it was inspected, which is important. Why it has to be reinspected periodically? And I, I could and think that is something that is not that is not done in Saint Lucia at all. So I, I could think now even um, just natural wear and tear from the elements, exactly. excess heat and rain and these kinds of things. Absolutely. Okay, now let's move on to the final topic, which is street lighting. It also falls under your purview. Can you describe the process by which uh, a street light is installed, first of all, in any area or not? Okay. The electrical department, as I mentioned earlier, is responsible for administering the, the street lighting, right? However, when it comes to maintenance, that has to do with Lucilec. Mm -hmm. Now, I find that that, 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 um, that whole thing is a bit confusing. However, I think that after two days, it's going to be you know, a lot clearer in the minds of the, the ordinary person. Let's say, for instance, you have a street light that isn't working, right, or, or that isn't bright enough, and you call Lucilec because that, that street light is on the pole already. Mm -hmm. So what it requires is maintenance. However, if it's a situation where you do not, you, there, is, there isn't a street light and you need a new one installed, that is when you contact the, the electrical department. Now, obviously, you have to contact the electrical department with, with certain bits of information. There is a form, obviously, but I'm, going to, I'm still going to say it out. Obviously, the, the area, right? You must, you must have the area. You mu you must, the area must be clear, right? And very importantly, there's a, 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 a yellow plaque on the, on the electrical, on the pole, right? It has four letters, four numbers. That's what they call a pole number. It is very important that this number, right, it's very important that, you, th that that number is brought in also. Because that's what they call the pool number. That is how loosely, like, which will eventually do the installation. Because we do, we do the approval of new street lighting. We don't do the installation. The installation is actually done by loosely. Like. And that's the only way, that's the easiest way loosely like, is going to be able to locate that pool. Now, I know there are situations where the pool will not have a number, 
right? So you bring in the, 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 po the number of a pool that is very close by you. And also there are situations where, the, where there isn't a pool at all. So in, that situation, that, in a situation like this, that is indicated to us. And also importantly, there must, there must be a contact, okay. you see? In any case, you, you see there is difficulty in locating that area and so on. So contact is also very important. Can anyone um, request a streetlight? And that said, um, under what circumstances would your department reject a request for streetlights? Yes, anybody can apply for a streetlight. However, as the name suggests, it's a street light. So basically, it's to, it's to illuminate public places. So for example, I don't, it cannot be a situation where the, 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 food pa the footpath leading to your home has a light, and you're still asking for another one to illuminate your backyard, right? In a situation like that, we are going to, we are going to reject it. Because the, the whole point of street lighting is to illuminate public areas, not to illuminate a porch or a backyard or something like that. Any final thoughts on, on the mandate and the works of your department before we close? Yeah, um, I must say that, um, you know, there's one, as we, as we, as we, were, talking, we were talking earlier, there's one general disappointment, right? And that is the fact that people don't return to us, right, after, you know, a few years. In the, as, I, as we mentioned earlier, in the case of domestic installations, five years and commercial installation, two years to have the, the, the installations Reinspected. That's a major headache for the, for the department. It's one that we're trying to resolve, right? We are trying to find new methods of doing that, right? By speaking to different agencies and so on to see if they, if they can they can help us in doing that, right? But if, I think it is something that is very important because we've even now, right? You find that on a on a for example in the past year, right? We've had no electrocutions. We've hardly had any electrical fires, or obvious electrical fires, which means that the installations in St. Lucia are becoming progressively safer. And I would say that the electrical department has a big part to play in that, right? Like I see us reducing whatever the numbers are even further, right? If people would, would adhere to the regulations, right? And inspect or, or you know, have the installations respected okay. during the allocated time. Okay, well, thank you very much. Mr. Shane Zha, the Chief Electrical Engineer with the Department of Infrastructure, Ports and Transport. We spoke today of the many mandates of the Electrical Services Department, including the installation and programming of traffic lights, uh, the electrical uh, inspections, and street lighting. This has been Issues and Answers with me, Miguel Favre, Communications Officer within the Department of Infrastructure, Ports and Transport. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope that this discussion was riveting and enlightening. Goodbye.